know it's a holiday weekend and people are worn out and recovering from all of their eating and they're celebrating. And if you're like me, you ate a bunch of food that you don't normally eat. And so now your body's going, whoa, what did you put in me? But we shall recover. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless this service today. God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Lord God, we pray that you would move in this place, that you would touch our hearts, touch our minds. God, that you would help us, Lord, to concentrate on you, to worship you, to praise you. God, that we would give you glory today. God, that we would let your spirit speak to us and minister to us. Oh God, I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you would bless this time together, oh God. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, God, that you would make your word come forth with authority, that your spirit would bring revelation. God, that you would give us understanding.
You can be seated this morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today. So thankful for the blessing of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to be going to Revelation chapter 10 this morning, still continuing our series. We're going to do the book of Revelation. I don't know about you, but I have learned some things as we have gone through the book of Revelation and, and uh, as I've dug into study, I've not been able to communicate everything that I have learned. Time will not allow it, but I've, I've spent time and, and hours reading through and studying and reading commentaries and consulting different people that I know and trust and have put confidence in, and uh, I am thankful for this time of study, and I pray that that it has blessed you like it has blessed me. For those that are just joining us today, just so you know, we are not trying to turn this into an end time prophecy series. We are not trying to tie this to current events and say this is what's happening and this is when things are going to happen. And right. We're not trying to turn it into that kind of thing. We're just studying the book. We're just reading through it, picking out what the verses are, exegeting the meaning and just trying to gain a deeper understanding of the book of Revelation. And so uh, if you're here and you're hearing this teaching, understand that the goal of this is not to tell you what's happened and tie it to this trumpet or that seal and, and all. We're just not trying to do that. Too many have tried to do that and failed through the years. Right. We're just going to teach the word of God and learn what Revelation wants to teach us. Amen? Amen. 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 So we're going to start Revelation chapter 10, reading in verse 1. He says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was as it were the sun, and his feet were as pillars of fire. Now some have tried to say that this was Jesus, that uh, because he, this angel shares some likeness of Jesus Christ, some have tried to say that this was Jesus. But John plainly says that it was an angel. And so we, we cannot attribute this to Jesus Christ. Uh, it would be no uh, shock to know that angels bear some of his likeness because he created the angels. And so it, it would be no surprise to us that some angels may look somewhat like him or bear some of his characteristics. But John plainly says this is an angel, and so uh, we, we have to be careful in Scripture that we don't take liberties that aren't there. And like I said, I know some, even some of the commentaries that I read, tried to ascribe this description and say that this was Jesus. But John plainly says it was an angel, and so... Uh, we, we need to be careful not to ascribe that to Jesus Christ. There are religions out there that have said that Jesus was an angel. And we are not that religion. We believe that Jesus is God. He is God robed in flesh. Yes. And he is perfect in deity. He is God incarnate. And so to try to ascribe him as being an angel would be false doctrine. So this is not Jesus. But this angel did bear some of his likeness. And he was classed as a mighty angel. This is the second time in the book of Revelation that we have seen and heard the term mighty angel. Uh, we saw one in Revelation 5.2. It spoke of a mighty angel. And as we go through, we will see in Revelation 18 another mighty angel. This is not, I don't believe, the same angel that was mentioned in Revelation 5 and 2 because John said he saw another right. mighty angel. Angel, so I believe it's a different one. Uh, so this is not the same one, but it is maybe one that is in that same group. These angels are revelatory angels. Anytime that you see the word ascribed, the mighty angel, it was used by God to deliver information from God to man. We see this when the angel spoke to Daniel in Daniel chapter 10. We see this in, in the story of Jesus' birth when Gabriel announced the, the, the birth of Jesus Christ. And so uh, we see the angels deliver news about events. One thing you will never see angels do is preach the gospel. All right. Angels don't preach the gospel. In fact, Paul warned the church of uh, Galatia and he said, if, if we or an angel preach unto you, other gospel, let him be accursed. Angels don't preach the gospel. God chose men to preach the gospel. He chose right. women to preach the gospel. Right. But right. angels can reveal events and they can reveal things 
that are about to happen. When um, Cornelius was praying, the Lord sent an angel to him and told him what to do. The angel told Cornelius, excuse me, that Peter was going to come and he would preach the gospel. If angels had the authority to preach the gospel, that angel could have preached to Cornelius. Right. Save Peter the time. But he said, Peter is going to come and preach the gospel to you. So these angels are used to deliver messages. In Revelation 5-2, the strong angel revealed the identity of the one to open the scroll. When John was having this vision of the scroll, the angel revealed that it would be the Lamb of God that would open the scroll. In Revelation chapter 10, our current chapter, we see that the angel is communicating a transition in God's program. Things are getting ready to shift. Right about now, we are about midway through the seven-year tribulation, Daniel's 70th week. And so this angel is communicating with John. And then in Revelation 18, we'll see another angel that will come, and he will uh, communicate the destiny of the, the beast, which we'll see later. The beast has a capital city, and the angel communicates what's going to happen to that capital city. In Daniel chapter 10 that I mentioned earlier, it talks about Michael, and the Bible calls Michael a chief prince. A chief prince. Now, many times we ascribe the word archangel to them, but the Bible very clearly said that he was the chief prince or a chief prince. We know that uh, angels, just like demons, have ranks and authority. And we talked about that a few weeks ago. I'm not going to get into that, but just understand that there are different levels of authority and power and rank within the angelic realm and within the demonic realm. And so uh, this angel is having a conversation with Daniel, and he says that there is a strong one, and he refers to Michael. We, he talks about, uh, you know, the, the battle that went on with the prince of Babylon and the prince of Persia. He said, I was battling with the prince of Persia. But then he goes on and says the prince of Grecia will come soon. And so there are angels and demons that are assigned to cities, to churches, to families. Now, I'm not here to, to get into spiritual warfare today, but you've got to understand there are demons assigned. There is a prince of demons that is assigned to my account. That his sole job is to unleash demonic attack upon Peru and Miami County. There are demons that are assigned to Carmel and to different cities. If there was a prince of Persia and a prince of Babylon and a prince of Grisha, then there are still demons today. The devil doesn't do anything new. And everything that he learned, he learned from God. And he mimics God's kingdom and God's authority. But if there is a demon assigned to Miami County, and he is the prince of Miami County in the demonic realm, then rest assured there is a mighty angel that is assigned to Miami County and Peru and And let us know and let us be reminded that only a third of the angels fell. So the demons that are against us are far outnumbered by the angels that fight and war on our The trumpet. So we see that there are countless angels. They vary in strength and they vary in their assignment. Verse 2. And he had in his hand a little book open and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. This is not the same book or same scroll that John saw in chapter 5. This is a little book and it was open. So John had insight to what was in this book. John could see what was in it. If it was written in a language that he knew, then he would have been able to read it. But the Bible says that the angel holding the book put one foot upon the sea and one foot upon the earth and the land. What that tells us is whatever is in the book is going to affect the whole world. The whole world. So by seeing his stance, one on land, one on C, we know that whatever is written is going to affect the whole world. Another thing that I want to bring out is this is an interaction
interaction between John and this angel. This is not a prophetic event of things to come. We're, we're having a, a pause here, and we had one a few chapters ago, and so I, I want to remind you that the book of Revelation is not necessarily in order of how things happen. Sometimes we get a pause. It's kind of like a parenthesis. If you're a grammar student, you understand that sometimes you're writing a sentence and you'll insert something in that yeah. sentence and you'll surround it by parentheses. And what that really means is this is not really part of the sentence structure, but it just helps if you have this bit of information. So it's surrounded by parentheses and you can take that statement in parentheses out and the sentence would still be complete. And chapter 10 is kind of like a parentheses. It's not really in order. It's not saying that this is going to happen in the future. This is a real life event that John partook of. This is something that is not going to be repeated. This is an encounter that John had with the angel. And so we should not look for this in a future event. First of all, that would mean John would need to be resurrected. Because we're going to find out in just a few verses that John eats the book. And so this is not a prophetic foretelling that John is going to come back and eat the book about midway through tribulation. But this is just a parenthesis in the book letting us know about John's encounter. We'll take up in chapter 11 next week with some, with some things that are happening. But this is just a pause and this is an interaction that we get insight from John. He is sharing his experience with us. So this book was open. It was a little book. And so that lets us know that it was not maybe, uh, you know, the, the bigger scroll that we saw earlier. It was finished. It was complete. It was written inside and outside. And when you had a scroll that was written on the inside and outside, that meant it was complete. Nothing could be added to it. And that was a very large book. This is a very small book. And we don't know what was contained in it because there were directions given to John as he was having this conversation. In verse 3, very quickly, it just says that he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roared. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And so many times when it speaks to an angel proclaiming something, it will often use that term, cried with a loud voice. And it's just talking about their authority and, and maybe the emphasis behind what they're speaking. He said seven thunders uttered their voices, and we learned earlier in this series that thunder announces God's moving, but it also announces God's judgment. And so anytime you hear thunder, you know that God is getting ready to do something. In verse 4, it says, And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up these things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. So John was about to write down what he heard the seven thunders speak. Now again, remember that seven doesn't automatically have to mean that there were seven different thunders. It's just a complete picture. But I believe with the way it's worded, the way it's translated, that it probably was seven different thunders or noises that he heard. And John was getting ready to write it down, but he heard a voice from heaven say, seal it up and don't write it. Now, it'd be kind of odd for the voice to say, seal it up. John hadn't written anything. So what would he be sealing? I believe the angel or the voice from heaven was telling him, keep it in your mind. Right. Remember it. Don't forget it. Keep it locked away here. There are some things, church, the things that we have heard, we need to keep them. Yeah. The Bible tells us that when the angel spoke to Mary about the birth of Jesus and all these things that were going to happen, the Bible says that Mary remembered these things and she pondered them in her heart. And I believe that's what the voice was telling John. Remember these things. Think about these things. Don't lose them. Don't forget them. But it's not for you to share. There are some things that God shows us that we don't get to share. There are some things that God will reveal to you that don't get to be repeated. I think in this day, we've lost some intimacy. We, we share every moment we have. And I'm guilty of it. I, I do it. I, you know, I, I just put this warning out there to all my friends and family. If you don't like what I post on Facebook, you don't have to follow me. But I use Facebook as a scrapbook. 
Because when the memories come back up every year, I get to go back. And there are things that I have forgotten until Facebook reminds me of it. And so we sometimes, though, share too much. Right. I have learned that there are moments that don't need to be shared. There are intimate things that don't need to be shared. Right. When you share them, it loses its intimacy. You don't need to share every word that you whisper to your wife. Right. You don't need to share every kiss, every date, every, every action that you take. Sometimes the privacy of the moment makes it more intimate. So there are some things that God has spoken to you and some things that God has spoken to me that we don't get to come to church and be like, Ooh, God showed me this and God told me that. Right. Some things God says, just keep it to yourself. I'll reveal it later. I've had God show me things in the spirit that I could have walked back and, and told people very specific things about their life, but God said, no. I just want you to know so you'll be prepared when it comes to pass. God didn't show it to me so I could announce it to the world. God didn't show it to me so that I could be like, look, I'm spiritual. I have God reveal a secret to me. But God said, hey, something's going to happen in a few weeks, and I want you to be ready for it. I have found that if God can uh, trust us to keep our mouths shut, he'll show us a whole lot more. Usually the people that have their mouth always running, their ears are closed. And God can't show us too much because we're too busy talking. Amen. I, I told my kids that when they were young. I said, God gave you two ears and one mouth. That means you're supposed to listen twice as much as you talk. Mm. <laughs> the same goes for God. Right. Sometimes we come and we spend our time in prayer and we, we oh God, I need this and this and this. And I need you to touch this and bless that and work this out and bless that person and I need this. And, you know, and we give God all these things, but then we forget to listen. What would God tell us if, first of all, we would be quiet long enough to listen? What would God tell us if at the end of our prayer time, or in the middle of our prayer time, sometimes my prayer time looks like a squirrel that needs room because I'll be singing, I'll be reading scripture, I'll be praying, I'll be shouting, and then all of a sudden I'm quiet, and then I'll just start talking again. But it's because I just, you know, whatever I feel, I let it out. That's why I come to pray privately, because you all think I was crazy. But we have to be quiet before the Lord. Right. We have to be quiet. And so God spoke to John, the voice from heaven spoke to John, and said, seal it up. Don't write it. Verse 5, he said, the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hands to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that are therein and the earth and the things that are therein and the sea and the things that are therein that time should be no longer. Now here's some other verses that kind of solidify the fact that this angel was not Jesus Christ because he raised his hands to heaven to make an oath. Yeah. And he swear by him that liveth forever. Well that would be Jesus Christ. And he swear by the sea. Well, he said he swears by him that lives forever who created the heavens and the earth and who created the sea and the things that are in the sea. So this angel is making his oath in God's authority. Now, if you're like me when I'm reading this, I'm thinking, why would an angel swear and make an oath when Jesus very plainly taught in the gospel that we should not uh, swear, we should not make an oath, but we should let our yea be yea and our nay be nay. Right? Jesus was very specific. Don't swear by God. Don't swear by the earth or the things that are in heaven or the things that are in earth. Just give your answer and let it be. Well, partially that's because he was speaking to the Pharisees and he was speaking to the religious crowds and they were, they were making oaths and they were swearing by God or swearing by heaven or any created thing. And the Pharisees were making these oaths with no regard to God or his respect or his authority. It kind of happens today, and we don't really realize it. You see, they weren't, uh, what the Pharisees were trying
trying to do is they were trying to put authority behind their words that they didn't have. They had developed a lot of traditions that did not come from the, the scripture, did not come from the Old Testament prophets. And so when they wanted somebody to listen to them, they would swear by God. And they would say, this is God's word, I promise it, and this is what it is. Sometimes we do that today. I see it done a lot. Because we'll say something, and we'll say, well, the Holy Ghost told me. Or God showed me. Instead of just giving a word of counsel, instead of just giving advice or stating a fact, we try to blame a lot of things on God. Because then if you don't listen to me, you're not listening to God. What they were trying to do was put God's authority on their statement. We do that today. We may not use the words, I swear, but we hear a lot of people today say, well, the Holy Ghost told me to tell you this, or God showed me this. Because then what we're saying is it's not my words, it's God. So if you don't obey me, you're not obeying God. Church, we got to be careful that we don't attach God's voice to something that God did not say. That's right. Amen. If you just want to give advice, give advice. If you just want to give counsel, give counsel. But stop attaching the Holy Ghost to everything you're saying. If the Holy Ghost didn't really reveal it to you, then just say it. But stop blaming God for everything that you're saying. Because you're trying to control people. You're trying to manipulate people. That's really what you're trying to do. Right. You're trying to give your words authority that they don't have. But what this angel was doing was pleasing and acceptable because what the angel really was saying was, I'm doing this not on my own authority. I'm doing this on God's authority. Right. And he raised his hand as a sign of submission, but also a sign of this is not me, this is God. So he makes a statement. He said, the time will be no longer. And so if we interpret that Correctly, it really means there's no further delay. There's no further delay. Now, what we're getting ready to see here is that uh, the two witnesses are going to be revealed, and then the Antichrist is going to come on the scene, and we are very quickly entering into the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week or the seven year tribulation period. So, what the angel is saying is there has been some delay, there has been some but time shall be no more. There's no more delay. I, God, is getting ready to move, and it's not going to be hindered, and it's not going to be delayed anymore. He wasn't saying that time would cease. Some people have tried to teach that. But we know that time doesn't cease here, because after the tribulation, there's a thousand-year reign upon the earth, so time is measured. So time itself cannot cease. What he's talking about is that there will be no more delay in God's judgment being poured out. Verse 8. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel. So the voice from heaven declared that it was an angel. All right. And he said, Go and take the book from the angel and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter. But it shall be sweet in your mouth as honey. And he said, I took the book out of the angel's hand and I ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And so he is commanded to eat the book. And we see this happen in Ezekiel as well, where Ezekiel was told to eat the book. And it tasted good in his mouth, but it was bitter in his stomach. And church, that it shows us that God's word is sweet to them that obey. God's word has spirit and life, yes. but it also has death and punishment. Right. And when John digested the book like us, we see eternal life, and we see the goodness of God, and we see the blessings of God. But because we digest the book and we understand the book, we understand that the same book that promises eternal life is also the same book that promises judgment and destruction. And so it's sweet to the taste. But the more we understand it, the more we understand that there is a world that is lost and dying and going to hell. And so while we are enjoying the blessing of God, while we are enjoying the sweetness of God, church, let us not forget that while our body and our soul 
soul is in this church and we're enjoying the goosebumps of the presence of God and the singing and the fellowship, let there be some bitterness in us that says there is someone lost and dying and I cannot stay in here and enjoy the comfort of God forever and never go out right. and never reach the lost. These words are spirit and life and they have blessed us, but we've also got to understand that there's another side to this word and it needs us to be aware and we need to be moved. Right. We need to be moved. I'm not trying to be too funny about it, but you all know when you gotta go, you gotta go. When you get cramps and you start feeling things moving, you gotta go. He said it was bitter in my belly. It motivated him to get it all. This last week we were traveling home and I looked at my wife and I said, we got to stop. No, I don't know where we were going. We were going to see Patty's house for her annual Christmas party she invites us to. And we were just outside of Huntington and there's a gas station right there on the corner of 24 where it turns off to go to, to Marion and there's a little Sunoco gas station. And I said, honey, you got to stop and you got to stop now. She said, we're only a few minutes from Patty's. I said, I ain't going to make it to Patty's. You've got to stop now. How did I know that? There was a bitterness in my belly. <laughs> I knew the time was now. And I got out, and I ran to the store. I said, where's your bathroom? She said, in the back. I said, Merry Christmas. God bless you. <laughs> Ran to the back. Why? Because that bitterness let me know that I had to take action and the time was now. The word of God needs to put something in us that says, yes, it's sweet. But the time is now. I need to take action now. I cannot delay. There are people dying lost. And I can't afford to sit back in my comfort and not be moved for them. Right. We live a few streets down from, from Duke's Hospital, and the helicopter flies over our house daily. Daily. Multiple times a day. This morning, it was flying over as I was getting ready for church. And when you hear that, you know that typically somebody's life is hanging in the balance. Right. And so our family's just always done this. Even before we, we moved here, if we would ever see a helicopter or hear, you know, the, the, the Samaritan or or Lutheran's helicopter fly over, we just pray for whoever was in there. And so now that we live right there, every time we hear it, God just touch whoever it is, move and minister, touch the family. Because I know that moments matter at that point. Yes, yeah. But what if we could look at every single person and know that moments matter? Moments matter. Let us digest the word of God. Let it get in us. Let it bring sweetness to us. But let it also reveal to us that moments matter. And people need us to be moved. People need us to be a little uncomfortable. So that we will reach out. And that we will minister to them. In verse 11, he confirms this when he says... Thou must prophesy again before many people, nations, tongues, and kings. As we digest the word, it must be confirmed in us that we cannot be silent. We cannot afford to withhold God's word. Maybe we've tried and we've been rejected. Maybe we've taught and preached and witnessed and it was, it was rejected and it was, it was not received well. He said, you've got to speak again. You gotta prophesy again. You gotta declare what thus saith the Lord again. Church, we've got to realize that our work is not done. We may have felt the pain of those that reject God's word, but we've got to keep going, we've got to keep preaching, we've got to keep teaching. John had this little encounter, but the angel said, Your work is not done. You must prophesy again. So church, what I would say to you today is your work is not done. Right. You might have digested this work. You might know it frontward and backward. But your work is not done. You must prophesy again. You must speak and declare the voice and the word of God again. Let's all see. Lord Jesus, we love you. God, we thank you for your blessings.
Lord, we thank you for this insight into John's encounter. Lord, help us, Jesus. God, that we will digest your word. God, that we will be moved to reach the lost and minister to them. Lord, that we will not get so caught up in our blessings and in our comfort that we forget to preach and prophesy to the lost. God, help us, Jesus, to understand that, yes, there is righteousness, peace, and joy, and the promise of heaven, but there is also judgment and damnation. God, move us to reach the lost. Jesus, give us your heart and your mind. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You're dismissed for a time of fellowship. We'll be back at 12 for worship service. God bless you in Jesus' name.